let's do a couple of practice sessions to really get in the habit of calculating everything that we need for a flight because practice really does make perfect with this E6B. I'll be the first one to admit it's a little bizarre and a little strange to use at first, but if you get into the habit of doing it a couple of times, it's not so bad. So let's take two scenarios, scenario A and scenario B. We've got some information given to us that's very similar to the information that we started with when we were planning out the example flight here before. We'll take this information and then using the E6B, we'll find out all of those unknowns on the bottom, like the true airspeed, the true heading, etc. So let's start with scenario A. So the first thing we want to do is figure out the true airspeed. We know what our planned indicated airspeed or calibrated airspeed, and they're kind of combining the two in the same thing. We know what that planned air, uh, indicated airspeed of 100 knots is. So let's start by setting the planned pressure altitude of 6,500 feet and the uh, temperature forecast at cruise altitude of 20 degrees, positive 20 degrees Celsius. Now I'm going to probably need to zoom in a little more to make this more clear here, but this is the pressure altitude and temperature window that I want to look at. So what I want to do is set that 20 degrees on top of my 6.5 thousand or 6,500. So let's see, we got uh, 10, 20, right about here. So here's the 20 degree mark, positive 20 degrees, and here's 6,500 right about there for pressure altitude. So let's zoom out a little and see what that's going to read on our true airspeed. So in the inside, we're going to take that indicated airspeed of 100 and then match it up out here. And notice here, it's not 11, it's going to be 110 because that's the order we're using. So 110, 111, 112, 113, 114 is going to be our indicated air, I'm sorry, our true airspeed. So we'll put that in, in knots. And now that we know that, we can figure out what our true heading is going to be in the other items here. So what we'll do for that is we'll flip that around and use the wind side. So let's start reading some instructions. First, we want to set the wind direction under the true index. So it says the forecast wind is 160 degrees at 30. So let's spin 160 degrees under the true index. So 160 is under there. Now we want to mark the wind velocity up from the center point. Again, this is where I like to have the center uh, dot there right over the 100 right there. You see that just to make it easier. Let me make it perfect too. Again, per pixels matter when you're doing this on the, uh, on the online version. All right, mark wind, wind velocity up from center point. So the wind velocity they're telling us is 30. So I'll put a nice mark right there on the 30 spot. Okay, that's step two. Step three is to set the true course under the true index. So our true course, which we would have found out by using a plotter, is said to be 300 degrees true. So we'll spin the wheel around, and that's going to take the red dot that I made with it and put 300 degrees right under the true index. And then finally, we're going to slide the wind velocity mark to the true airspeed. So we already figured out the true, true airspeed of 114. So now it's just a matter of sliding this guy up until that red dot is right on top. I'm going to zoom in on this in a second, but it's right on top of the 114 arc for the speed. So let me zoom in just so that we can have a really good look at where that is sitting on. And I can even adjust it just to make it right here. Okay, so here's 110 knots, here's 120 knots. Basically, that's going to be the halfway 115. My red dot is sitting right there on 114 for 114 knots, true airspeed. All right, step five is going to be to read the ground speed under the center. And there we are. The ground speed reads right underneath where, right there 135 so I can enter that into my answer sheet right here 135 knots I'll put knots just to make it clear all right so we're here for ground speed but we're also here for wind correction angle so wind correction angle marks uh, or reads right between the center line and the wind velocity mark 
So notice where that is. There's that red line, and you see here's the center line, and then you have 10 degrees left, 10 degrees right. The red dot is sitting almost smack right on the 10 degree left arrow. So what that means, our wind correction angle is gonna be a negative 10 degrees. Now there's no uh, answer choice here for wind correction angle because it's having a skip a step. We're going from our true course, or our planned course at 300 degrees true, and when we apply that wind correction angle of negative 10, that'll give us 290 degrees for our true heading after we've applied that. Okay, so next we want to apply the magnetic variation. This is an easy one, right? They give it to us. Now we would have gotten that off the sectional chart just by reading what the isogonic line in the area of the course is going to be, but it's going to tell us that 9 degrees west is going to be our variation. Remember, east is least, west is best, so we're going to add 9 to our true heading of 290 to get a magnetic heading of oops 100 or I'm sorry 299 degrees all right so we're rolling along here so now the last couple of things we need to find are the estimated time in route and the fuel consumption so this is where we'll go back to that slide rule side to figure those two things out let's go to the slide rule side and basically, you know, you can use the slide rule for estimated time and route, or you can use just a good old-fashioned distance equals rate times time calculation. But we'll use the E6B for this. So we know our ground speed. That's going to be important. And we know the distance of the route, 88 miles. So with those two pieces of information, we can figure out how long it's going to take us to complete this flight. So we'll use that rate arrow again. So we're going to set that rate arrow underneath our speed. So we'll spin that guy until that's right underneath 135 knots for our ground speed. And there it is right there. I can zoom in just to give us a better look at where that's sitting. 60 minutes is going to take us 135 miles. There's our rate. So we're not we're interested not in uh, how long it's going to take us to go 135 miles, but how long it's going to take us to go 88 miles. So we'll look at where that 88 is. Here's 90, here's 89, here's 98 basically right here and then notice the timing just shy of 40 so basically 39 minutes is what it's going to take us to get in route at this speed over this distance so that'll go in our answers as well 39 minutes and then the last step that we want to do here is compute our fuel consumption so this is nice we've got all the information we need for that too our fuel flow which we would have gotten out of the POH is 12 gallons an hour so we'll set 60 underneath the 12 and then it's just a matter of reading the fuel consumption off of 39 minutes so if this is 60 minutes 39 minutes is going to be over here so what does that match up with well if that's going to be eight gallons and that's going to be seven gallons that's roughly 7.8 gallons right there there's 39 minutes and then 7.8 gallons on the outer ring so we'll put that in and there you have it. That's all of the information calculated using the E6B here. Let's look at another scenario here, scenario B. You know, practice really makes perfect with the E6B. So we'll, we'll go through a whole uh, another scenario and exercise here. So we'll start by trying to figure out our true airspeed. So we're going to need the planned indicated airspeed of, one of, of uh, 145 plus the pressure altitude and temperature forecast at cruise. So let's zoom in a little here, make it a little easier on the eyes. And what we're going to do, the forecast altitude is negative, or the forecast temperature altitude is negative five degrees. So negative five is that guy right there. So we're going to want to put that line right about here where 9,500 is going to be. So I'll spin that and get that right there. So there's the negative five degree line just kind of straddling between nine and ten thousand at nine thousand five hundred <laughs> okay so we're looking for the true airspeed if our planned air or if our indicated airspeed is 145 we're going to look to that part of the arc here right at the bottom that's 145 for airspeed move it to the right just a little bit so it's visible and then we're going to read the true airspeed off the outer ring and if you forget how to do this you could read the instructions here right you set the pressure altitude opposite the calibrated airspeed on the inner scale read the true airspeed on the outer scale so this 160 that's 170 so we can count 162 164 166 
168. It's about halfway between 166 and 168. So we'll say a true airspeed of 167. All right. So now we want to figure out the true heading and the ground speed. So this is where the wind side is going to come in. And again, you know, you like to start the wind calculation. First thing to do that I like to do is to put that center line right on 100, just to make the math a little easier. <clears throat> All right, step one, set wind direction under true index. So our wind direction is forecast to be 300 degrees. So we'll spin the ring here to put 300 under the true index. Yep. And step two is going to have us mark the wind velocity up from center point. So that'll be 40 knots there. You see that in the, uh, in the scenario. So we'll put a little red dot right around where the 40 line is there. Let me do that again, get it a little closer. Yeah, you know, let me zoom in just to, it's not that I'm a perfectionist, it's that, you know, these, these things make a little bit of a difference when you use the computer. So let me make sure I got it on there. That's good, okay. So we got the wind speed in there. Step three is gonna have us set the true course under the true index. So our planned true course, which we would've got off the plotter, is 172. So we'll spin the wheel again, and there goes the red dot with it. 172 is right there, and then Let's see, move this up so that we can read. Oh, let me get the instruction first. Step four, slide wind velocity mark to true airspeed. <coughs> so there's a wind velocity mark all the way down there. We wanna slide that to our true airspeed, which we figured it out, uh, we figured it out to be 167. So we're gonna wanna slide this all the way up. I'm gonna have to do this in stages here because it's a long way up sliding that red dot until it is right on the 167 line. So just to, to look at it here, here's 160, here's 170. 165 will be there, so 167 is roughly right there. All right, so we're done spinning and sliding the E6B. Let's go into the instructions again. Obviously, this is easier when you got it in your hand. <laughs> uh, all right, step five, ground speed reads under center. So all I have to do is read that ground speed right there. So you see 190 is there, so it's just too shy of 190. So I have a ground speed of 188. And then wind correction angle reads between center line and wind velocity mark. So here's that line. I'll zoom in again so we can see it. Here's 10 degrees, so that's a 10 degree right course correction. So this mark right here is gonna indicate 12 degrees. So basically, I'm gonna to need to add 12 to my planned true course to get my true heading of 184. Okay, so I've got ground speed and true heading. So now the next step is to figure out magnetic heading. This is the easy one. I have 11 degrees east. East is least, west is best. So I just have to subtract 11 from my true heading to get my magnetic heading of 173. All right, now let's figure out the time and route and the fuel consumption. So this is where the slide rule side will come in again. And estimated time and route. We've got a ground speed of 188 and we've got a distance of 384 miles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that 188. That's that. That's going to be that mark right there. Or I'm sorry. I'm going to spin the 60 rate to put the 60 rate right on the 188 mark right there. Remember, I'm going to travel 188 miles in 60 minutes. So that's that's how that matches up. And what I want to do is I'm interested in how uh, how long it's going to take me to go. 384 miles. So I'm going to work my way around the outer scale here. And this would be 400. Let's see, this would be 360, 370, 380, 390. So 384 is going to be right around in there. So you read that off of here. It's not going to be 12, but you're going to have to add a zero to that basically. So that's going to come out to about 122 minutes for my estimated time and route. 
All right, next is the fuel consumption. So my fuel burn rate is 18 gallons an hour. So again, I can spin the wheel here to put the rate arrow right on 18 for my for my burn rate. Now, I'm interested in how much fuel I'm going to burn, not in 60 minutes, but in 122 minutes. So I'm going to go right back to where that 122 mark is again, and then read my burn rate. It's going to be 37 gallons. And I'll put that in the answer. And then there we have it. That's the scenario B mapped out there. So here are both of those scenarios now with all the answers filled in that we figured out. So I encourage you to sit down with these and practice them just to get a little bit more familiarity with how to compute the, uh, the various calculations that we'll need. So we'll use these skills when we do our plan for the cross country between uh, College Park and Hagerstown.